You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC88 Paradise, the series where we talk about classic Japanese PC games for the NEC PC88, and also discuss how they're related to other classic games that you may be familiar with. In Japan, Ease was one of the best-selling PC games of the 80s, therefore it's no surprise some Japanese developers tried their hand at making their own Ease-inspired action RPGs. But when it comes to Ease imitators, there's one game that stands out to me for being not only very similar to the first two Ease games, but for also spawning a long and modestly popular series of its own. I'm talking about Zack from Micro Cabin. <laughs> Specifically today I'll be talking about the very first Zack game, originally released for the NEC PC-88 in May of 1989. For context, this was about a year after Ease 2, and a couple of months before Ease 3 was released. A quick note about the title, Zack is probably not the intended pronunciation. The katakana actually says Saku. I often jokingly refer to this series to myself as Sark. I don't know, maybe the pronunciation has something to do with the little triangle that always appears above the A in the title? However, I think when the majority of English speakers see the spelling X-A-K, they're going to say Zack. So that's what I'm going to call it throughout the video. Zack, Zack, You'll also see that Zack 1 has sort of a subtitle, The Art of Visual Stage. I believe this is in reference to what the developers call their VR, or Visual Representation System. Supposedly this was a game engine which allowed for extra tall characters that can seamlessly appear in front of or behind obstacles. To us today these seem like just normal overhead view 2D graphics, but according to the developers this was difficult to pull off at the time with characters this tall, and they felt it was worth bragging about. When compared to the original PC-88 versions of Ease 1 and 2, the characters are noticeably taller in Zack. Oh! On the back of my copy, it looks like someone has taken the seal which was originally on the spine and just stuck it here. I think I'll just leave it here to avoid dealing with the residue. On the inside, first of all this sheet of paper is actually for sending the game back to Microcabin in the event of a defective copy. Guess they were expecting this to be a common occurrence. Lucky for me, my copy still works after 30 years. Next is a flyer for the original soundtrack CD and cassette. Then we have a user disc sticker and a sort of illustration card with a guide to the different areas of the game on the back. The manual is in full color for the first half, showing the story, characters and items, and the black and white section in the back tells you how to start the game and how to play. Finally, the discs themselves. Zack is stored on four 5-inch floppies. To watch the opening, we simply insert discs 1 and 2. The story of Zack is pretty straightforward. 250 years ago, the god Duel sealed away the demon Badu, but now a mysterious man has resurrected the spirit of the demon, setting off a wave of monster attacks across the kingdom. Only a descendant of the god Duel can defeat the demon and restore peace. That descendant, of course, is you, the protagonist. After the opening, we're asked to replace disc 2 with disc 3, and press space. We find ourselves in the first town of the game, in front of our hero's home. Man, I really like this music here. Even though this game only supports the original Monoral FM soundboard, it sounds so good I had to double check that it wasn't using the soundboard too. Let's try out some of the buttons. The left trigger on the controller will cause our hero to do sort of a shrug. Hey, look at me! I don't know what I'm doing! Well, enough screwing around. Let's access the system menu by pressing the help key. There are a number of options here, like the ability to change the screen size. I believe this is supposed to improve performance, but I just left it alone. By the way, I really like how much of the screen is filled by the gameplay in Zack, unlike most PC-88 games where the action fills only a small frame on the screen. In the next option, you can adjust the speed setting of the game to match your CPU. With my 8MHz PC-88, I actually prefer the slightly fast setting, which appears just below the 8MHz setting. 
This setting is nice and fast, but feels a bit less erratic than the wait off mode at the bottom. Next we can choose whether we want the status bar to appear at the bottom or the top of the screen, or not appear at all. I don't really like any of these options, so I'll just leave it on the default. The one thing we definitely need to do is create a user disk, which is the last option here. The user disk is basically just a copy of disk 1, but the game won't let you save to the original disk. When creating a user disk, you can enter any name you want for the hero, but by default the name is Latok, which becomes his name throughout the rest of the series, so I'll refer to him as Latok for the rest of the video. After the name entry, we're asked to insert a blank disk, and after a bit of a wait, we finally have our user disk. We can now just use the user disk in place of disk 1 next time we boot the game. So now we're all ready. The first thing we need to do before we can leave the town is find the mayor's glasses, which he dropped in the church. Return them and the mayor introduces you to the king's messenger, Pixie, who explains to Latuk that he is the descendant of Duel, and that he must go to the kingdom's holy palace to defeat Badu and save the land. We also learn that Latak's father is named Doruku. In the English patches for the MSX and Super Famicom versions, instead of just going with Dolk or something, they went ahead and made it Dork. <laughs> I guess they just couldn't resist. He is not a Dork! Anyway, here we're given the king's official seal, which will allow us access around the kingdom, as well as 600 gold. Now we can buy equipment. The equipment system in Zack has a few interesting quirks which I should explain. Each piece of equipment has a minimum level that needs to be met before it can even be purchased. Throughout the game, this becomes an even bigger obstacle to obtaining equipment than money. For now, let's just buy the level 1 sword, armor, and shield. The equipment menu in Zack is awkward. You'd think they would have taken some inspiration from Ease, which gets it so right. Here you actually need to press down on the D-pad, and then select one of the available swords below, and then move over to armor by pressing right, then press down again to select an armor, and the same again with shield. It took me a bit to figure this out and get used to it. Next, let's go to the magic shop. Here you can buy magic, which are really just one-time use items. There's no MP or anything in Zack 1. The most important thing I want to show at the magic shop is the cast magic on equipment option. For a fee, you can have magic cast on your sword, armor, and shield. You'll then see a star that appears next to that equipment in the menu. This will make the equipment stronger against undead and ghost enemies. You always want to have magic cast on your equipment whenever possible. So this becomes basically a hidden fee that occurs every time you buy new equipment. Trying to use equipment that hasn't had magic cast on it yet is sometimes even less effective than just continuing to use your previous magical equipment. So now we're all equipped. Hey, that shrug button now causes Latuk to draw his sword instead. So that's what it was for. So yes, Zack is a game that uses a bump attack system, like Ease. Except here, you need to hold the left trigger button to draw your sword when you bump into enemies. And there's actually a reason for this. When you don't have your sword drawn, you are in defensive mode using your shield. This can be useful for getting past tougher enemies and for taking less damage from boss projectiles. Another difference is that whereas in Ease you want to attack enemies from the front with a slight offset like this, in Zack this doesn't work. Instead you want to attack enemies from the sides or back when you can. Most effective of all is pinning your enemy against a wall or other obstacle. They'll be helpless to fight back even when facing you. This allows you to even take down enemies much stronger than you are. Just like in Ease, your HP gets gradually restored when standing in place. One way that Zack differs from the original versions of Ease 1 and 2 though, is that in Zack you can walk diagonally. So I'm having a great time chilling to the music and doing some initial leveling, but where do we need to go? There are a number of areas we can get to from the beginning, but the game does a pretty good job of letting you know where you're not supposed to go by placing enemies that are too difficult to take down yet. This forest area seems to be where the game wants us to go first. There's an injured girl we can rescue here who will hop on your back as you take her to her house nearby. Since she's in pretty bad shape, her father asked Latuk to take her to the hospital in town. We also learn that her name is Frey. Hey, that name sounds familiar. After leaving Frey at the hospital, her father asks Latuk if he can help to calm the tree spirit that protects the forest. This is the first boss of the game, 
How would you like to have someone come along and pick something off of you? Making sure you don't have your sword drawn when the projectiles hit you is the secret to taking him out. After defeating the tree, we get a small reward from Frey's father, and he tells Latok that according to legend, no one can defeat the demon Badu without the power of Zack, which is the name of this world. That doesn't give much of an idea where we need to go next, but judging by enemy difficulty, this fort seems like the right place. It's the first large dungeon of the game. I really enjoyed exploring around here while listening to the calm and soothing music. Anyway, this old man needs us to bring him medicine. After we do so, he gives Latuk the master key to the dungeon. Next we find a hungry guard who wants soup. Soup. I found a pot of yummy soup in the kitchen on the ground floor earlier, but the game wouldn't let me take it. No soup for you! I guess now it will. Take it, it's yours. As thanks for the soup, the guard gives us nothing. Well gee, thanks. It turns out that once we've found the blocked exit door to the fort, talking to the soup guy again will give us the key to the hydraulics room, where there is a switch to open the exit. But the guard there says that the switch doesn't seem to be working, and to check the water reservoir room to get it unstuck. Ah, uh, yes. Well, we'll have it fixed for you in a jiffy, won't we, Shrimpicus? Whatever you say, Dopius Maximus. It's no wonder it doesn't work, because there's a dragon boss in the water reservoir. Latuk knows what he has to do. Defeating the boss not only fixes the switch, but the broken statue of the god Duel speaks to Latuk. He tells him that with his current abilities, he can't defeat Badu. First, he must find the three Zack Deeples. What the heck is a Deeple? Is that what happens when you try to shorten Deep Purple into one word? Whatever it is, Duel gives Latuk his first Deeple to start his collection. So now we can finally exit the back door of the fort and move on. But it doesn't look like we're gonna get very far. This stupid guard says he decided to break down the land bridge when monsters attacked from the north. But not to worry, he's heard a rumor that there's a hidden route to the Holy Palace beneath the town of Normana. Oh, that's great. So you're telling me I came all this way through this dungeon just to find out I can't go this way? Oh, that's totally not a problem at all. I'll just go back through the dungeon and go searching for this super secret route you've heard about instead. Thanks a lot. On the way back from the fort, we find Bobby, the son of the weapon shop owner in the first town. I had learned earlier that, ironically, Bobby hates weapons, much to the chagrin of his father. That boy ain't right. Normally, this wouldn't seem like such an important fact that they would even bother writing it in the manual, but there's literally going to be a pop quiz now. Bobby says that he was worried about Latok, so he came to find him but was attacked by monsters, and that if only he had brought something better than a puny short sword, he might not be in the sorry state we found him in. He asked Latok to help him back to town. Why, sure, Bobby, I'll carry you back to town just like I did Frey. Why not? I select Y. But wait a minute, Bobby doesn't like to use weapons? Bobby doesn't like to use weapons? Ah, I wish I had saved more recently. I was getting kind of cocky riding the high of clearing that dungeon. Now back through the dungeon and we can do this again. Wow, you literally have to select N multiple times before he gives up. Now take that, you stupid bat! Back at the first town, Frey has fully recovered at the hospital. She gives Latuk a protection ring as a reward, and that's all we'll see of Frey in the first game. Kind of strange considering that she later becomes a major character in the series, and even gets her own game. So we need to go to the town of Normana in order to find that alternate route. I had actually already wandered into this town earlier, not knowing that I needed to complete the fort dungeon before anything happens here. The town is located on the other side of a poisonous swamp that drains your HP. Seems like kind of a strange place to build a town. All they needed was to have one townsperson who says, Oh no! After the recent monster attacks, there's suddenly a poisonous marsh outside our town. But no, there's nothing like that. The mayor tells Latuk how to operate the gondola nearby in order to access the cave below the town. Yay! Whee! This cave is the first area where your HP doesn't get restored when standing in place. However, you can buy a life cape in town, which will allow you to restore your HP anywhere. You may recall there's also a cape in Ease 2, which does the same thing. 
You have to switch items frequently in this cave, which is surprisingly problematic. The disc access required to open and close the menus makes it take a while. The first thing we find in this cave is a man in a cell who asks us to let him out. Do so and he's like, Bohohoho, now I'll have my revenge on the people of Normana. Oh no, I'm not falling for these shenanigans again, game. Good thing I just saved. I'm gonna load my game and leave him there in that cell to rot. Next we find a pirate base in the cave, and a pirate on the beach nearby who mistakes Latok for a new recruit. He asks Latok to bring him Grog from the base. Twice. After the second time, he gives Latok the key to their booty for safe keeping. He wants to make sure he doesn't get drunk and lose the key again. Sure, I'll take good care of it. You can trust me, man. Time to kill some pirates and steal some booty! In the chest we find some money and a red jewel which will be necessary to complete the dungeon. After this though, we come to a dead end. There doesn't seem to be any way forward, so fine, I guess I'm supposed to help that guy in the cell. After releasing him, I use teleport magic to travel back to the town of Normana, where he is transformed into a monster and is attacking the town. Defeat him and the mayor thanks Latak profusely and gives him a medal that will allow him to see secret passageways. Latok says to himself that he feels guilty about the whole thing, but doesn't tell the mayor he was the one who caused the town to be attacked in the first place. Now we can get through this dead end. We have to pass through a few passageways with faces on them which allow us through when we show them the king's seal. The boss of this dungeon is a water elemental and fire elemental monster who combine into one for a second phase. These guys have kind of an unintuitive pattern you have to learn in order to win. For some reason you can only hit them when they are moving straight across the middle of the screen. After defeating them, we use the red jewel to get past the two statues, and the king's seal to get through the last face doorway, which brings us to the end credits. Well, that's Zack 1. The story didn't come to a resolution, and it was a little shorter than I was expecting, but I guess it was still maybe about as long as Ease 1. Oh wait, there's more? That's kind of weird, putting a credit sequence in the middle of the game, but I guess now it's time to move on to disc 4, which contains the second half. Similar to Ease 1, we can't go back to any of the earlier areas from the previous disc after the changeover. We find ourselves in an underground town filled with hobbits and elves. The mayor tells Latuk he will need to climb the Tower of Zagrad in order to get to the exit at the top and move on to the next area kind of weird that they decided to build their town between two large dungeons without any other way in. Here's something pretty annoying, there's this guy walking right in front of the entrance to the town who tends to get in the way. Every time you talk to him, he offers his advice for 500 gold, and it's hard to quickly say no since both trigger buttons in this game are confirmed. You have to be really careful every time you run into him to move the cursor to the right and select end, or he'll take your money every time. I don't even need his advice. All he says is that there are many traps in the chests in the tower, something I could have figured out on my own. Luckily they seem to have removed this guy in at least some ports of the game. In front of the tower, we meet a guy named Rune, who says he is also a descendant of Duel, and that Lanta can go ahead and pack his things and head home since he is far stronger and he will no doubt be the one to defeat Badu. What a shithead. Unfortunately, he doesn't understand that Latuk is the protagonist, so you've got to head into the tower and keep going. I found the enemies in this tower to be a lot harder than the previous ones, especially these little clones of Latuk. Uh, they use a real jerk. Yeah. It was really tough going in the tower before I managed to get from level 15 to level 20 and buy some of the better equipment in the Hobbit town. The first thing we can do in the tower is find these little folks who live in a treasure chest who are looking for their lost son. We can find their son hiding in a skull a few floors down. Bring him back to his parents and they teach Latuk to spell magic. Then we can use that on this guy who says he stupidly turned himself into a ghost in an attempt to avoid being attacked by the monsters. He turns back to normal and teleports back to the town. Next time we see him he gives us a pet named Rabbi, but it doesn't do anything yet. The boss of the tower just summons a bunch of zombies which we have to defeat, and then finally we're in the fire zone, the last overworld part of the game. There isn't much here except a small encampment of people in a cave. Here we meet Rachel and her ailing infant brother. She gives Latuk a fireproof cape and asks him to find her father, who went to the fortress nearby in order to find medicine.
In the fortress, the issues with this game become more pronounced than ever. Here I have the life cape equipped, but I need to change to the fireproof cape to pass through this flaming doorway. First I press F3 and wait for the disc to access the items menu. Then I can select the fireproof cape and wait for the disc access to close the menu. Then we wait again as the disc accesses the graphics for Latuck not wearing the life cape. Then we press the right trigger button to use the fireproof cape, and the disc accesses the version of Latok wearing it, which I'm pretty sure is visually identical to the other cape he was just wearing. Now we can finally walk through the door, but we'll need to do it all again next time we need to change items. There's also a gas mask to get through these rooms filled with gas, and you'll also want to switch back frequently to the life cape, and slowly wait for your long HP bar to refill. Just forget about then switching to the protection ring to raise your defense. The disc access time is just not worth it. I would call all of this annoying, but instead let's call it what it really is. A pointless waste of time. I understand that the lack of available RAM probably made the disc access necessary, but someone should have realized this was annoying during playtesting and did something. Using items to get you through a dungeon can be a fun game mechanic, but not when it takes so much time and it has to be done over and over again. This is one reason you might prefer to play one of the newer versions of Zack, where this isn't as much of an issue. So anyway, in the fortress we find Rachel's father, but he and Latuck get closed in by this lava pit, which is only passable while someone is constantly holding this switch. Rachel's father gives you the medicine needed to save his son, but bravely decides to sacrifice himself and stay behind so that Latuck can get out. Don't worry, I'm pretty sure this quick shot in the end credits is someone coming to save him later. After giving the medicine to Rachel, we learn that the only way to get to the Holy Palace is by riding a dragon from the roof of the fortress, but the ring required to call the dragon was lost in one of the bunk rooms there. I went to the bunk room, but couldn't figure out how to find the ring. I ended up using a walkthrough, and it turns out this is the only part where you need to use your pet Rabbi you got earlier, to help you find the ring under a bed. Even knowing that I needed to use Rabbi, it took a while to find the exact spot where you need to stand when you use him. This part also seems to have been improved a bit in later versions of the game. So we get to the roof of the fortress, and there we finally find the second Zack Deeple, inside a box that Latok found way back in the first dungeon of the game. It started shining when he got to this roof, so he decided to open it. Yay, just one more Deeple to go! We can call the dragon using the ring, and guess what? A surprise shooter stage! This was a fun little treat, but the stage and the boss are not very difficult. I beat it on my first try. Then we catch up with Latok's arch-rival Rune. He was beaten by that shooter boss we just finished, so I guess he wasn't so great after all. He gives Latok the best sword in the game, as well as the final Deeple. He warns us about the puzzle stage that lies ahead. The world of gold. No, Henry. Try not to talk. You have to go through the doors for every letter of the alphabet, A through G. J? but you can only use each letter once. You also can't just do the letters A through G in order. I managed to keep pretty good track of which letters I had already used in my head, but I was this close to getting out a pen and paper when I cleared it. So we finally found the end boss room. The god Duel speaks again to Latak here and infuses his equipment with the power of the Deeples, so that he can defeat Badu. I'll put a mild spoiler warning here before entering the boss room. Inside, we find the pixie from earlier in the game, who laughs menacingly and reveals that she is Badu, and also that it was Latok's father, Dork, who revived Badu in the opening sequence. He was under the control of Badu. What a dork. <laughs> anyway, it's time for the end boss. Latok's sword has now been replaced with a projectile attack due to the power of the Deeples. You'll need to projectile your way to victory. It took me a few tries. After the boss, the pixie is back to normal. When she asks what happened, Latok says that she was only having a bad dream. The pixie accepts this explanation and says they should hurry home. The game seems to be saying that Badu is gone and that the pixie is back to normal, but I prefer to believe that the pixie was Badu all along, and now she is only pretending to be back to normal as she quietly plots her revenge. Anyway, it's time now for the real credits sequence. What's this? Oh, this is the real party, Chris. The first port of Zack was to the PC-98 just two months later. 
According to Wikipedia, this version was actually developed alongside the original, and development was even ahead of the PC-88 version for some of the process. The game itself is almost exactly the same as the PC-88 version, and doesn't take much advantage of the superior hardware, other than making the text a little sharper and easier to read. There is, however, a minigame called Cax, hidden on disc B. Five months after that came the MSX2 port. This one had all the graphics redrawn, and many prefer the cuter anime-style look of the characters. They had to put the action inside a smaller frame in order to allow the MSX2 to keep up, but overall the game runs pretty well. This version was highly praised for having some of the best music ever produced on the MSX's FM pack. And there's even an English patch available too. Four months after that came the X68000 version. This is the first one that really feels like a major upgrade to me. The music is in stereo for the first time, and many of the sound effects are ADPCM. The disc axis issues in the original are non-existent. The scrolling is smooth, and the graphics have all been redrawn to take advantage of the X68000's resolution and palette. However, I wouldn't exactly say they're the best graphics I've ever seen on the system either. It does look very much like the original with just a fresh coat of paint. Overall though, a very nice version of the game. Console versions didn't come until over two years later. This is where things really got changed up. On the PC Engine, Zack 1 and 2 were released on a single CD-ROM. I wonder where they got the idea to do that. This version is overall a much faster, smoother, and easier experience than the original. I played through the Zack 1 portion after finishing the PC-88 version, and it felt like a speedrun in comparison. The enemies don't respawn unless you move to another area, and the life cape works even while Latak is moving, making most of the dungeons a breeze. Your HP also refills extremely quickly, raising the quality of life here quite a bit. The enemies also move so fast you can't really try to attack them from the back or sides, but you usually don't need to since they die so easily anyway. Since this was ported by Nihon Telenet, the music has that Valis and Cosmic Fantasy sound to it that's super nostalgia inducing for me. Unfortunately though, a lot of the tracks had to be cut in order to include music from both Zack 1 and 2. Hey, this BGM doesn't go here. This is also the only version to not include the ridiculous credit sequence in the middle of the game. Moreover, even in Zack 1, here Latak has the ability to jump like in Zack 2. Unfortunately though, this version is quite buggy and feels poorly balanced, usually on the side of too easy. The shooter stage and end boss of Zack 1 are also pretty broken. Overall, I'd still highly recommend this one for impatient people who just want a quick way to play through the first two games. Though I have a feeling the lack of an English patch will be a deal breaker for many. And finally, in 1993 came the weirdest version of all, a Super Famicom port programmed by Tokai Engineering and released by Sunsoft. This one has fairly nice chunky looking graphics and some decent Super Famicom music. The Ease style bump attacks have been replaced with a button to swing your sword. Unfortunately, this is the only Zack game that was released on the Super Famicom. But fortunately, it has an English patch. And that's every version of Zack 1. I love it. The original PC-88 version does have some issues that needlessly waste your time, as I mentioned before, but overall I found the gameplay, graphics, and music to be some of the best the PC-88 has to offer. It doesn't hurt sometimes when game designers copy from the best. And the graphics here are probably technically superior to those of the games it draws inspiration from. But would I say that Zack is better than Ease? Well hell no, Ease 1 and 2 are classic. Everyone needs to play through some version of those before they even think of touching Zack. But if you love Ease and are looking for something similar, then I'd recommend you give Zack a try. It's quite a worthy imitation indeed. Thanks for watching this episode of PC88 Paradise. This has been your host, Mr. Jakes. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I hope to see you back for the next video here at Basement Brothers.